Father God, we have families that are bereaved. We ask that you would please comfort them in their time of affliction. Give them peace at this time of loss. And find a way, Father God, that you would get the glory out of the situation, Father God, that someone might come into a relationship with you or a closer relationship with you, Father God. But we ask that you would just be their comfort, their peace, and their strength in this trying time, Father God. We also uh, lift up Brother Mims, Father God, who's recovering. We ask that you would heal him in his body and give him medical care, Father God, that is uh, following your instruction that you would guide, Father God, the nurses, the doctors, those that are caring for him, and those that are giving him instruction. Father God, we ask that you would just touch that situation and bring him back to full health. Give him full range of motion, Father God, so that uh, when we prepare to come back and worship in your sanctuary, he'll be able to, to stand, Father God, and, and worship you as we all look forward to coming back into the sanctuary, Father God, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. We ask these and all of the blessings in the precious and powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 If you if you would, I hope you have your your handouts uh, for today. And. If you would just take a look at the first handout, there's one in your email named Charleston. If you would just go ahead and, and open that up where it says Charleston. And the reason that's been put there is because today marks the fifth anniversary of the Charleston Church Massacre in South Carolina. There's an article that was sent out, and I'll just briefly give you an, an overview. Dylan Roof, who was a white supremacist, entered into a prayer meeting at the Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. And as he entered into this church and he was welcomed uh, by nine people in this prayer meeting, he opened fire and killed nine of these uh, members of the church, including the pastor, And that happened five years ago today. It's still something that our culture happens to be struggling with. And I wanted to talk about today a modern meditation on an ancient prayer that is found in the Psalms, Psalm 140. And David had to address certain situations, not exactly of this kind, but I think it definitely definitely speaks to it. If you would look at that, that PDF that says Charleston, there was one line in this article that really stood out to me. And it says that Roof, which was the, the killer, would later confess to the murders, explaining that he wanted the murders to start a race war. He additionally told investigators that he almost changed his mind about the shootings because church members had been very nice to him. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 140. Psalm 140. I'll go ahead and read it for us for context. go ahead and read it for us in context out of the New King James Version. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men. 
who plan evil things in their hearts. They continually gather together for war. They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. Selah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hand of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purpose to make my steps stumble. The proud have hidden a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set traps for me. Selah. I said to the Lord, you are my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, you have covered my head in the day of battle. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Selah. As for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let the burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name, the up right shall dwell in your presence. So a modern meditation on an ancient prayer, keeping in mind that David is a author of this psalm there's some background to this song, and some of the commentators differ on whether it came from earlier in David's life where he was being attacked by Saul. Some of them say that it's later in David's life during the rebellion of Absalom, but regardless, of whether it was earlier in life or late in life, David faced affliction from his enemies. And in this ancient prayer, this psalm of lament, David is pouring out his heart to God regarding his situation of being attacked by enemies. There's, there's no mention of any provocation. So David feels that he's being attacked unjustly, that there's nothing that he's done to deserve this type of treatment. But regardless of the situation surrounding why, David just knows this, that I am being attacked. I didn't do anything to anyone. I did not attack them first and they're retaliating, but I have just found myself in a situation where I am under attack. If you would look at the first five verses, the first five verses, and you can open up the other um, PDF that came through email, it's, it should be Mark Psalm 140. And when you look at that, there's going to be the first heading is a desire for deliverance. In the first five verses, in the first five verses, we see a desire for deliverance. Take a look at how the attacks come from a wicked person, how the attacks come from a wicked person. First, we see in verse two that they come from a wicked heart. That's your first, that's your first blank. They come from a wicked heart. And we see that in verse two that the wicked person that David is talking about, they plan evil things in their hearts and they continually gather together for war. 
they continually gather together for war. So there's things that we have to be mindful of in terms of how we are walking about in our lives is that there are wicked people that surround us. And those wicked people they have their issues and it stems from the base comes from their heart. The base comes from their heart. So we have to be mindful that people do what they do outwardly in their behavior because of what they believe inwardly. So their beliefs are going to dictate their behavior and one of the beliefs one of the things that they're doing is that they're planning evil things in their hearts. So we've got to be mindful of where wickedness comes from. It comes out of the human heart. He continues on in verse 3 and says that not only does it come from a wicked heart, but it also proceeds out of a wicked head. It says they sharpen their tongues like a serpent. And the poison of asps is under their lips. So have you ever been accused or have you ever talked about someone and mentioned that they have a sharp tongue? So here David's using that similar type of illusion that we would use now if, of saying that someone has a sharp tongue whenever they're, they're biting. Their words cut deeply. And it says they sharpen their, their tongues like a serpent. And it goes on to give a specific idea of a type of serpent. It says the poison of asps. An asp is an Egyptian snake whose venom can kill an average human in under four minutes. So in their speech, we can identify someone that's wicked. So of course we know that it comes from their heart, but it's gonna proceed from their head. It's gonna proceed out of their mouth. And that poison is like a fang of a serpent that is just waiting to release its venom. This is how David is describing his wicked attackers. So not only do we have the head and the heart, but also we have wicked hands. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purposed to make my steps stumble. So we have wicked hands that are setting out to set a trap. They are trying to cause us to stumble. And it's, it's very tempting to return evil for evil. It's very tempting to return uh, a lash for a lash and respond in kind when people attack us. Because their purpose is to make us stumble. The purpose is to get us to play their game. And in verse 5, it continues to give us more details. It says, the proud have hidden a snare for me. Says, so they've set a trap. And cores, they've spread a net by the wayside. They've set traps for me. And again, the psalmist says, Selah. So that word Selah means that at that moment, we need to pause and reflect. And there's a pause after talking about the poison of asps under their lips, that they speak with vile and venomous speech. And then there's a pause after they've set a trap for me. So the psalmist wants us to pause and contemplate what is going on with our attacker? Why are they doing such a thing? And how ought we respond? So there's a desire 
for deliverance in verses 1 through 5. Awareness of the attacker and the wickedness of the attacker is coming from their heart. It proceeds out of their head and that it is administered by their hand. But we do need to ponder why this is happening and how this is happening and how we ought to respond to such attacks. And so David decides to respond by commemorating the character of God. He commemorates the character of God in verses 6 through 8. How does he do it? Let's look at verse 6. I said to the Lord, you are my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. So here in verse 6, he acknowledges God in a very specific fashion. He acknowledges God as Yahweh. He says, I said to the Lord. And so whenever we see Lord capitalized, if you're looking in your Bible, you should see the word Lord in all caps. Whenever you see that, that's referring to um, the name of God as Yahweh. It would be represented as Y-H-W-H. And so the first way that he commemorates the character of God is by identifying by his covenant name. This is how someone would refer to God, not as a force, not as some uh, supreme being or deity, but as specifically the covenant-keeping God of Israel. So if you look at under com commemorate his character, uh, that next blank is Yahweh, God as covenant keeper. Yahweh as God as covenant keeper. So he, David, in response to a wicked heart, wicked heads, and wicked hands, his response is to commemorate the character of God, and the first way he does that is to recognize God as covenant keeper. If you can think back, a covenant is a promise. Has there been some promises that God has kept for you? I can tell you that there's several promises that, that God has kept for me. Number one, just me being saved. The greatest gift that was ever given, Jesus Christ, and that he is holding me and keeping me and securing me in my salvation. And all the blessings that he's poured upon me, my family, and you have to recognize that God is a promise keeper. He's a covenant keeper. And specifically in terms of David, he's recognizing him as the God of Israel. But David doesn't leave it right there on that level. He takes it even further because he goes on to refer to the Lord. He says that you are my God. You are my God. So he's taking not just from a covenant-keeping standpoint and not just from a national um, standpoint in terms of God as covenant keeper, God as the God of Israel, but he brings it into the personal relationship. If you look at line two, the care under the character of God, my God refers to God in personal relationship, personal relationship. That's your next blank. So David is highlighting that I am going to the God of the universe who is also the covenant-keeping God of Israel, but more specifically, God, you are my God. You are the one that can save me from these wicked attackers. And there's no other power that I trust in except for you. 
So David goes on and he says in the psalm, hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. And then in verse 7, he refers to, O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. You have covered my head in the day of battle. Now, he's just called him the Lord, and then he's referred to him as my God. And now he refers to him, he refers to God as God, the Lord. So now he's taking and and adding yet another aspect, and he's commemorating the character of God, that God, I know that you're a covenant keeper. I know that I have a personal relationship with you, but I also want to recognize something else about you and about your character. And so when we see God the Lord in the Hebrew, that is Yahweh Adonai, Yahweh Adonai. And this particular name of God refers to the authority of God, the authority of God. So that's your next blank. Uh, God, the Lord in Hebrew, Yahweh Adonai, God in authority. That's your blank. God in authority. So David is recognizing that, God, you have the authority over my life, over all of heaven, all of earth. So I'm submitting to you because you are the strength of my salvation. You are what's keeping me because I can't keep myself. He goes on to say that you covered my head in the day of battle. Now, he's not just talking about some piece of armor, not that, oh, well, God gave me a helmet. But with all of the different things that are going on, the melee of any type of battle, there's arrows flying, swords swinging, but somehow, some way, David would emerge victorious and he would escape these battles with his life. He covered David's head. He covered David's head. And so David is recognizing that it's because of God's authority that he can superintend those situations and circumstances surrounding David's life to where he would still come out of these battles unscathed. But now he turns a corner in verse 8 and he leaves his two positive requests and now begins to make one negative request. And he asks God, do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked, do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. And again, Selah. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. So he's asking God to help me in these two areas. Help me with these two, verse 6 and verse 7. I want to recognize you as my God, and I want to recognize your authority over heaven and earth. But also at the same time, I need you to do something about them. I need you to do something about these wicked attackers. Do not grant their desires because their desire is to hurt and harm me. Their desire is to scheme against me and I don't want them to succeed when he's saying lest they be exalted. And again, the psalmist marks Selah. So there's a pause to ponder hear why David would ask that and what are the implications of asking for this negative request. Not negative in the sense that it's bad, but he's asking for something to not happen. Does that make sense? Instead of asking for something to happen. So we've seen that David, number one, had a desire for deliverance and then he commemorated God's character. And here in verse 9, we see uh, an invitation to imprecation. An invitation to imprecation here in verse 9 through 11. Now, imprecation is a, is a technical term that I want to introduce to you if you haven't already been introduced to it. 
because this portion of this psalm, this psalm is, is a lament song. A lament means David is crying out. He's crying out to the Lord for help. But he eventually gets to something specific, and this portion is called an imprecatory portion, imprecatory. And so imprecation, I'm going to give you the definition. It's the next blank in your handout. Imprecation is to invoke evil upon or curse one's enemies. Imprecation is to invoke evil upon or curse one's enemies. Wow. That's in the Bible, y'all. But we have to be very careful. I want to caution you right now well, as I'm introducing this to you. We've got to be very careful as how we read and how we interpret this portion of uh, psalmic scripture. And there, there, this is not the only one. There are many psalms that fall under the category of imprecatory psalms. But let us, let us walk through and look at this invitation to imprecation. So in verse 9, David is, again, he's praying. This entire psalm is a prayer. This is a conversation between David and God. And God is, is, is listening to David, and David is trying to speak to God how he feels. And there's no filter, as you can see. As, he, as David is thinking it, he's just giving it to God. Okay, let's take a look. As for the head of those who surround me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let the burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. Wow. David sure is serious. David sure is serious. He is not happy about this evil attack. He's already gone to God and recognized God in terms of his character. And he's, he's trying to, to, to pray the, the, the prayer in the right order. But at some point, it's like, hey, you know what? God, I need you to do something about this enemy. And so uh, I like the way that H.B. Charles, uh, the pastor of the Shiloh Church in Jacksonville, Florida, identifies an imprecatory uh, portion of scripture. He, uh, he identifies it as a get em Lord prayer, a get em Lord prayer. And so David is inviting that God take care of these uh, wicked attackers and he's giving them he's giving God some suggestions some things that 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 perhaps that he wants to see and so he's saying that this imprecation he's praying on his enemies now before you go and start praying Psalm 140 verses 9 through 11 on somebody in your life that's upsets you, please press pause and rewind because that is not what we are to do with the imprecatory portions of psalmic scripture, okay? Many of you may be familiar with the, the ACTS model of prayer. It's an acronym. A-C-T-S, the Acts model of prayer. It's a very nice and neat way that you can go to God and pray. It gives you a form and a structure as to how we ought to pray. And that, that acronym, Acts, stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. It's a nice, neat, orderly way that you can begin to pray by recognizing God and then you can move on to confessing your own sins and shortcomings then you can give God thanks for what you are what you already have and what he's already done in your life 
and then you move on to supplication, which is the, the for lack of better term, the new business that you want to take up with the Lord. And you can move through this nice, neat uh, prayer format. And sometimes in life we can do that, and it's, it's, it's a great way to keep ourselves disciplined as to how we ought to approach God in a, in a nice, orderly fashion. However, when we as human beings, as we're designed, when we get into certain emotional states and our amygdala is hijacked and we go into f to, to, uh, freeze, fight, or flight state, when we, when we get so upset that we just have to cry out to God and say what's on our mind, what the, this imprecatory portion of uh, this pericope here in Psalm 140 tells me is that God can handle your messy prayers. God can handle you talking to him without a filter. God can handle that your prayer may not fit into a particular pattern. That you can just speak to God how you feel honestly. Sometimes we try to force ourselves into having these petite, pious prayers. Where we pray the things that sound good, but it's not really how we feel. We pray that so-and-so would be blessed or that so-and-so would... Uh, have a certain issue in their life addressed, things of that nature. But how often do we go to God without a filter and just tell him what's on our mind exactly the way we feel it? That's that genuine communication that prayer can afford us if we're honest enough to approach God the way that David is approaching God. Now, this doesn't mean irreverent. This doesn't mean that we just talk to God any kind of way, like we're talking to a, a, a friend or a cousin or something like that. No, 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 no. We're still before the throne of grace. We're still talking to the creator of heaven and earth. We're still talking to the God of the universe that has sovereignty over all. So this is not a call that you're going to lack reverence in speaking to God. But if we can be as honest as possible with ourselves and as honest as possible with God, he can handle whatever is going on in our life. So not only that, but again, an imprecatory prayer is directed at a particular enemy. Is directed at a particular enemy. So if we're going to read the imprecatory psalms or imprecatory portions of psalms and we're going to think about how would we lift that principle up in the modern day, we have to be very clear on who our enemy is. Because my enemy and the enemy of the believer is not a particular human being. It's not a particular person that occupies a particular government position, whether that be on the national, state, or local level. It's not somebody that cut me off in traffic. It's not somebody at the workplace that's always saying my name when I'm not around. It's, it's not those things. Those human beings, regardless of how they act and behave, they are not my enemy. So for the, the New Testament, the, 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 the believer modern day, we have to realize that we don't wrestle with Flesh and blood. That's your next blank. Who is our enemy? Go to, go to Ephesians 6 and 12 briefly. Ephesians 
6 and 12 briefly, and we can see the identification of the enemy. I'll go ahead and read this, this short verse, verse for us to give us context. Ephesians 6 and 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So my enemy is not any human being that I can identify. But the Bible says Paul writing to the church at Ephesus has identified our enemy. And he says that it's not against flesh and blood. So that eliminates all of humanity. That eliminates all of humanity. But here, you're, here are four, four areas where we do have enemies. And these are the next four blanks. Paul says, not against flesh and blood, but against, number one, principalities. Principalities. Number two, against powers. Number three, rulers of the darkness of this age. And fourth, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the imprecatory psalms or the imprecatory portions of psalms, if they're to be used today by the modern day believer, by a New Testament believer in Jesus Christ, these imprecations are against our actual enemy, which is these principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, because the things that are driving what we see come from these different human beings, they're under the influence of the enemy. They're doing what they're doing, number one, because of their sin nature, but also they're influenced to continue in that sin nature by the enemy. And again, the psalmist marks Selah to pause and ponder. And he goes through from verse 9 through 11, he's going through this invitation to imprecation. And he's calling down how he would like God to deal with the situation. And David, again, is speaking in the physical sense at his time about his physical enemies. But we can see uh, in terms of our application, it's against a spiritual enemy. But David concludes this particular psalm with a call with confidence, a call with confidence. In the last two verses, after David has expressed his desire for deliverance, he's commemorated the character of God, and he's invited God to imprecation. Now that he's gotten it off his chest as to how he wants uh, God to respond in his situation. He calls on God with confidence. And he says in verse 12 and then verse 13, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. The upright shall dwell in your presence. So he calls on God with confidence. And for your own, uh, for your own study, I would definitely encourage you to um, continue reading in Psalm 141 in your own time. It's a companion psalm to Psalm 140, and it deals more with how David looks at himself 
Whereas Psalm 140 is more how he looks at God and he looks at others. But we see that after, after David has looked at his situation in terms of others that are attacking him, and he looks at his situation as far as who God is in his life, after he's been honest with God and expressed his frustration and how upset he is at his current condition, he now returns to call on God with confidence. And he says that he knows the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. So in your next blank David is confident in purpose. He's confident in purpose, we see in verse 12. And the purpose is that the, the, the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted. The Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted. And that there's going to be things that are going to happen to us in this life just by the simple fact that we live in a fallen world amongst other people that have a sin nature and not all of all of us that have that have grown up have come to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and so those that have yet to accept Christ as their savior, they're still continuing in their sin. They're still continuing to live by their sin nature. And there are people, systems, and structures that are built by those people with that sin nature. And it should not come as a surprise to us whenever that sin nature rears its ugly head that doesn't mean that we're happy about it and that doesn't mean that that there is uh, nothing that we can do about it either but it does mean that there are uh, tragedies that will happen in life adversities that will happen in life and to me I see it as the part of the reason that we should continue to spread the gospel throughout the culture, throughout our city, state, our country, and the world is because some of these things in certain people's lives, this will never be solved until, until there is a change of heart, a literal change of heart. This should encourage us to go out and make disciples, to follow the great commission that Jesus gave us. That we should do as David says he knows the Lord will do, that he will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. And part of the way that we're going to do that is by showing a wicked world the love of Christ. So David is confident in God's purpose. And also, he's confident in God's praiseworthiness. He's confident in God's praiseworthiness. That's your next blank. Look at verse 13. It says, Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name. So if we've been declared righteous by Jesus Christ we ought to be able to give thanks we ought to be able to give praise to his name we ought to be able to take into account all the things that the Lord has kept us from and how he has pled our cause and how he is keeping us even under wicked structures, wicked situations. Even in the face of that fallen world, even in the face of that. That we should be able to give thanks because of how good he has been 
to us and that we know what his purposes are for the future. Last but not least, he, David, calls with confidence because he's confident in the presence. He's confident in the presence of God. He says that the upright shall dwell in your presence. The upright shall dwell in your presence. And so David knows that ultimately his safety and his security is going to be in the presence of the Lord and that also his ultimate destination is to be in the presence of the Lord, not just now on earth, but forever in heaven. And so that gave David confidence to continue on even in the face of wicked attackers, even in the face of structures and strategies against him, even in the face of these principalities and powers and rulers of this age and spiritual hosts in heavenly places that were conspiring against him, that were lying on him, and that they were trying to commit violence against him. So as we look at Psalm 140, even in light of what's going on in our current circumstance and situation, there should still be a desire for deliverance where we want ourselves and we want to see other people freed from wicked attacks. But while we desire that deliverance, we have to do so from the position of commemorating God's character, that everything begins with God and who he is in our lives, and that we should try to emulate his character, a character of uh, someone that keeps their promises, a character of someone that wants to engage in a personal relationship, a, a, a character of goodness and mercy and justice. We also have to face the reality that we do have enemies. We do have enemies. But that the real enemy that we have is not the flesh and blood of a brother or sister. A fellow human being. That's, that's, that's not our true enemy. But that even in light of all that, that we can call on God with confidence. We can call on confidence, God on, in confidence, knowing his purposes, knowing that he's praiseworthy, and knowing that ultimately because of the greatest gift that's ever been given, because of him giving his son Jesus Christ, that those that believe in his name will enter into the presence of the Lord. So I thank you for your time, for your attention, and looking through a modern meditation on an ancient prayer in Psalm 140. Um, in Psalm 140, and I do encourage you to um, study Psalm 140. Um, take a look according to the handout and continue reading into Psalm 141, um, which time will not allow as we're beginning to uh, wrap up this Bible study. Uh, but I do encourage you to uh, in your own time, in your own personal study with the Lord, read, read Psalm 141 in complement with Psalm 140 to see even more about how we ought to uh, respond and uh, pray that God would keep us safe from wickedness. Amen, amen. Um, I would also, uh, being that this is the, the fifth anniversary um, of the Charleston Church Massacre, that you would keep 
uh, that church and all those families that were affected uh, in prayer, as I, I'm confident that this is a day that they are going to be uh, remembering the tragic events of that of that evening, and uh, I just saw it as a as a, a reminder to um, you know the culture and context that we're living in, and that tragedies uh, will happen, and tragedies unfortunately are still happening, but we can take comfort and know that that there is a plan and a purpose and that God will keep us um, in this time. And we just need to call on him. We just need to call on him. Come on. Work it, work it, work it.